Um, I want to welcome you folks. Thank you for taking some time out of your uh, Tuesday night um, and either eating an early dinner or having a late dinner on our account. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ron Barraff. I'm Director of Historic Resources and Facilities for the Rivers of Steel. Um, and I'm here with Kirsten <laughs> Payne and Ryan Henderson. I'll let them introduce themselves a little bit more in a moment. Um, but we'll be you know, talking with you folks, hopefully over the course of the next four weeks about archives and preservation of family treasures, how to preserve these things, how to collect stories and how to do research. This is all about how to become more involved in your community and understand what your community assets are. My name is Kirsten Payne. I am a site management coordinator and interpretive specialist for Rivers of Steel. And you'll probably be hearing more from me in week three as I walk us through how to do some, how to do some research. And again, my name is Ryan Henderson. I'm also a historic site coordinator and interpretive specialist here at Rivers of Steel. And thank you with those that uh, you know, welcome to you all here tonight. Glad to have you guys and you know, looking forward to the rest of the series. <laughs> Um, so we are um, pretty chatty people. We will warn you that. Um, <laughs> so, but, but it'll be great. You, want, you ready to drive? I'm ready to drive. All right. We're going to screen share with you guys real quick. So give us just a moment to get this fired up. All right. Everybody see that? Looking good? Perfect. Okay. So I want to start, so for the first session here, as you can see, um, the question that we want to address first, since we're going to be working a lot on archives and different ways we do things in the archives and the way you can replicate some of these things, you know, at home, the first question we really want to deal with is what are archives? Because, you know, we're aware that some of you guys might not really be familiar with what an archives actually is. You know, you may have heard the term before, um, but an archive is probably or possibly something that one of you, you guys have never visited before. And in addition to that, it is slightly different than what you might find, say, at a library. So to start out with, we did want to talk just a little bit about what an archive is. Um, so to start at the beginning, yeah, the thing that really kind of differentiates an archive from well, a library, for example, you know, a library is a lending institution. Right. And it's going to be collecting you know, primarily books. Though some libraries also have a collection of documents and other things. An archive is not um, a lending institution. What it is, is purely a collecting institution, though it also has, as you know, part of being an archive, a public accessibility um, requirement, right? Which is to say, everything that is held within an archive is held within the public trust. Archives in general, we're going to get a little bit more into this a little bit later on, but archives in general are also specific, right? So in a sense, you know, if you go to one library, say you go to the Carnegie Library of Homestead, right? Um, and then you go to, say, um, Carnegie Library of Oakland, you know, what it's going to be is going to be there, both of those types of, uh, you know, both those libraries are going to have books in them, maybe some of the same books, et cetera. Mm -hmm. In an archive, the materials in each archive are within, as we would say, a, um, a scope of collections, which is to say that each archive, while there might be some overlap, is collecting specific different items along kind of these specific lines. So for example, in the case of our organization, Rivers of Steel, what we collect are items related to the industry of steel and iron in Southwestern Pennsylvania. Now, the, the scope of that sometimes, what we actually collect sometimes goes beyond just that scope, but primarily, you know, we are a, a institution that collects, preserves, researches, and displays items basically related to steel and iron. Well, exactly. So archives have, you know, an input and output function. So there, there are items being donated, coming from the community, telling the story of the community, but it is our function to provide these materials back to the public. You know, it, it, again, unlike a library where you're going in, you can do research, or, you know, but you're basically working from publications and books. This is working with primarily, primary resource materials, you know, um, items that were collected and or donated by the community, in some cases by organizations, corporations, et cetera, um, that you're being able to mine a little bit deeper and get 
those primary resource materials that may end up in a book that's in the library. So it really sets us apart. Um, and very often archival material is considered one of a kind um, and it has a, it has a degree of irreplaceability to it that there are very often items that there are no known duplicates of those items. And because there are no known duplicates of those items, it, it becomes an imperative for an archive to preserve and protect them, but also to understand how those items fit within a broader collection of other irreplaceable items. Right, a, a rather good way to think about it, you know, something which is a phrase which is brought up often when talking about an archive, is that the collections within it are held in the public trust. You know, that's, that's kind of a guiding principle for us. And what that means is that, you know, when we accept an item, um, we are going to not only do our best to preserve that item, to ensure that it continues to exist for future generations, but also to then make that item accessible again. Um, and again, most archives are gonna be research institutions of some kind, which we'll talk more about, um, in this and later sessions, but also, you know, in our case, for example, our archive also has a display function. Where we have an exhibit where we have the ability to exhibit some of these. Um, and we can get into that more as we move down the line because, you know, every, you know, all archives are slightly different. And, yeah. And we are slightly to the side of others because we have more mixed collections. But, but the idea primarily that we're trying to get across here is that these are items collected from the community, from the people that live there, that tell a story of that community that are often singular and in, in, in their existence and function, but then are available for researchers throughout the world and um, that are used for interpretation and then help tell a story of a region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, there you go. So there's a, there's a lot of different archives in this region. Mm -hmm. um, you know, each one again, as I said, is very different. A, a, and so I've tried, you know, since I've I've been here and in others um, within this region, to think of collecting in Greater Pittsburgh and the Western Pennsylvania region, but not as a competition, um, but more as as a collaboration. Each one of these institutions within the greater Pittsburgh region all have a function and they all tell a piece of the story that together create a, a collective story and collective memory of this region. So here, you know, there are the obvious ones with, you know, University of Pittsburgh um, and, and their extensive holdings and they, those are very varied within it. There, there are union holdings, there are um, labor related, there are um, personal papers, the Thornburg papers, things like that, university papers, um, used for a lot of research by students. You know, Carnegie Mellon has a large um, archive, but their archive is also very divided because they have a special botany collection, which is very particular to this region. Um, you know, the Carnegie libraries have their own special niche. And then there are the larger institutions that are looking um, much more widely at the story of the nation in the case of the Library of Congress. Um, and then there are even more general ones that you can find online that the Pralinger Archives, archives.org, which really gives you a cross section of pretty much popular culture in, in, in the last hundred plus years. So these are all you know, tools that you can find from your home. A lot of these are accessible from home, but all tell a different piece of the story. And why that's important is basically because depending on what type of material you want, you're going to need to go to a different archive, essentially, right? Again, if you think about a library, you know, a library might have a kind of, you know, general information desk, or they can help point you in the right direction of materials that they have there to kind of find general knowledge. But if you're looking for very specific type of things, in a lot of cases, again, like we said earlier, primary sources, a lot of those are only going to be found in archives and then in specific archives. So, you know, as an example, um, I mentioned before, our organization is primarily concerned with collecting uh, materials related to the history of iron and steel, right? 
if you were to go to the Heinz History Center, you know, down in the Strip District, what you're going to find there is that there. <laughs> Did you say you go to the Heinz History Center down in the Strip District? What you're going to find there is um, uh, materials that are related to a kind of like look at a cross section of southwestern Pennsylvania, or particularly in their case, just as an example, Ron was saying earlier about how different places have different things, you know, glass and things, right? They have a great deal of material related to sort of um, the history of glass making and, and uh, samples thereof from this region. Or alternatively down there, as you might imagine, the Hines History Center, they have a great deal of material related to Hines. They are generally a survey mm -hmm. a much broader um, picture uh, of the region. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that it's, it's not a competition, it's, it, it, it is um, a collaborative. From our organization and the others around here, we have a good sense of who has what sort of holding so that we can work together and direct people to the right place. Um, you know, we talk about, about you know, how we, we don't know all the answers, but we generally know where to find them. And that's because of these sort of collaborations. And there's a lot of cooperation between the institutions themselves. When you know someone goes to the history center and they're looking for something very specific to um, iron and steel, they tend to send them here, and vice versa. So that it is really a great network that um, works well on the professional level, but works even better on the public and research level. And especially when people have particular projects that they're working on. Let's say that you are not just working on a family history, but let's say you are working on the history of a family owned shop in a Keysport, for example. You are going to want to search out local resources, of course. So you're going to start in the Keysport, but with this larger regional network, you'll be able to access related and affiliated institutions. So if you start with McKeesport, they might refer you to us, depending on what kind of shop that was. If the shop, let's say, doesn't necessarily have an affiliation with iron or steel making, but maybe let's say they are affiliated with uh, glass products. Maybe they are a shop that made or sold glass products. Perhaps the Heinz History Center would have something on it. So you, as somebody who is conducting research, do not necessarily need to know where everything that you're looking for might be. You just need to find yourself into one of the places that are affiliated with each other and that we can always communicate and point you in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, our, our kind of general, you know, what we want to help you guys do at the end of the day is accomplish whatever your research task is, right? And in most cases, I should mention this here too, you know, for example, our archive is, is free to access. You know, we're by appointment. Um, so, you know, you can't just necessarily walk in the way you would do at a library, but it's pretty easy to get an appointment down here. And a lot of other archives work in a similar way. Um, sometimes, you know, it depends on the archive. Sometimes there's a fee associated with doing things like making copies of stuff. Sometimes you can just take some pictures yourself. It all depends. But most archives have that kind of information that you need on their website. But again, because we want to help you guys accomplish your research tasks, you know, if, you, if you're trying to go to an archive, you know, you go to us, you go to us. Like Kirsten was saying, yeah. if we can't help you find what you're looking for, generally we're going to help you find the place that does have what you're looking for, because again, we all know each other. Or in some cases, you know, and this is part of the reason we'll have these links up top to Library of Congress, archive.org, Google Books. In a lot of cases, depending on what you're looking for, some of this material is already online. Some of this material, um, you know, we have, for example, in our archive, we have some material online, but, um, you know, so a lot of other archives have significantly more. Or if you're just looking to, let's say, view resources, you know, you don't have a necessarily project in mind, but you just want to get an idea of what these organizations have, you could flip through and just look at some pictures of things. Um, or again, in our case, we have some pictures, but we have our, if you go to riversofsteel.com, you know, we have our full collection list there. So you can kind of search it, see what we have. You know, um, the, the best thing to do is, and it can be difficult sometimes to know where to start, but if you were to punch in, you know, archives that have, you know, X material in the Pittsburgh area, you know, when you find that archives website, then you go there, you see what they have, you see if there's anything posted, you see how they describe what they have. Um, 
you, you'll be surprised at the kind of level of specificity that you can get, you know. Earlier today, it's a little outside of Pittsburgh area, but we were just visiting the Genora Smog Museum, right? And I don't know how many people know this, but, you know, if you're interested in finding out information about, you know, the Genora Smog incident, I mean, they have an archive there that you can go and research at. And a community-based archive as well. Yes. So that's part of what we do as an organization as well, is work with these other institutions, a lot of historical societies, et cetera, throughout the region to assist them and, um, pulling their archives together, pulling their assets together, um, building a better facility, and, and which actually can go probably to the right. Mm -hmm. the next slide. And I see that Emily's raising her hand. Do you yep. want to say something, Emily? Yep. I just wanted to say that uh, people were having a little hard time here in Ron, so I just want to. I know, I got to lean in more, and I have a croaky voice. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Is, is his level better now? We moved the computer closer. Yeah, we're trying to capture everybody. And I'm yeah, leaning way. Yeah. That's okay, too. Yeah. Okay. So using Rivers of Steel as an example of an archive that you might find in a region like this, um, there are some questions that people might have about what our organization is and what we do. Yeah, so what we're going to do, we're just going to do, again, to try and answer some of what we're guessing are going to be some questions you might have in your mind about archives. We're, we're going to use ours kind of as an example to talk about how we do things here. Real quick, though, something I should note um, about our organization, which does in some cases make us slightly different, maybe, than some other archives you'll find. Um, we are not just an archive. What we are is a national heritage area. Um, and now... I could really get in the weeds and probably bore you guys a little bit on the exact jargony definition of what a national heritage area is, um, and I don't want to do that. So instead, this is the best way I'm going to describe it, um, and I'm going to describe it by comparing it to something different, which is a national park. So, okay, you're thinking about a national park, in your mind, right? Um, a national park, a national monument, these are areas that are owned by the federal government, um, either as, in some cases, nature preserves or because there is, you know, um, historic, for example, if you think about out, out West, right, a lot of Native American sites are, are now monuments in many cases, right? So there's some type of historic landscape there that is um, attempting to be preserved and, again, is owned outright by the National Park Service. The thing is, is that there's many other areas that do have um, – a cultural landscape in many cases, in addition to a physical landscape worth preserving. But those areas really can't be owned or preserved as such by the federal government because, again, somebody already owns it. There's an active community there. Um, in those cases, many times what you find happening is the creation of a national heritage area, which is basically a partnership between the public, which is to say the federal government, and the private, um, which can take many forms. But in our case, you know, what we are is we're a, a uh, nonprofit, right? Um, it administers this heritage area. And this is, this is the main point to make here, right? So we are not employees of the National Park Service, okay? We're not employees of the federal government. We receive some money from the federal government, but, you know, if we were employees, uh, we would have a better pension and I would get a better hat and uniform, right? Um, so basically, you know, in many cases, what we are is we're essentially grant funded. The only reason I bring this up in relation to us is that, um, you know, our archival holdings, in a sense, are, are uh, somewhat vast. Like, right. So we control, the, for example, the carry furnaces um, down in uh, if you're in Homestead, but it's right across the right across the Rankin Bridge down in Swissvale. Um, but I mean, we have some capabilities in our size that not every archive is going to, um, you know, we have a pretty well kitted out archival space down here, you know, the stacks behind us that you're not always going to find necessarily if you go to, again, if you go to the Genora Smog Museum, right, their archival space is not necessarily going to have some of the same features. So again, when we talk about all this to say, when we talk about what we have here and how we do it here, it might not be exactly the same at other archives that you go to. Yeah, um, they're, they're all different, you know, it, and there's very, you know, varying levels from the University of Pittsburgh that has massive archives and massive warehouse space to someone like the Denaro Smog Museum. Uh, but really for Rivers of Steel, 
we're an anomaly as far as heritage areas go. Most heritage areas do not have a museum and archives division. Most heritage areas don't actually have physical space that they store. They, they rent some offices or whatever, and, and they work within a, a corridor, a, a series of communities, whatever that may be. But fortunately, we are that anomaly, and, and, and it grew very organically in, in the sense of Rivers of Steel began as a collective of folks in Homestead, primarily, you know, greater Homestead, let's call it, that um, were watching the mills go down. And in 1986, Homestead Works closed. Two years later, it's all sold off to the Park Corporation. And there was a, a, a call from community organizers, from academics, et cetera, and just concerned citizens that we need to do something to save our history. We need to do something to preserve this story, this you know, 120 year story that is not just the story of Homestead, but is really the story of Western Pennsylvania and the growth of America in the 20th century. And if we allow it all to disappear, we are doing a great disservice to those who come after us. And, and, and so if you can preserve some of it, you can use that history to help drive economic revitalization. So it starts as a, as a small little task force, basically centered around the, the homestead works and preserving pieces of the homestead works. Now, over the ensuing years, it becomes a much larger network in, in the heritage area, so that by 1996, we're this national heritage area that now encompasses eight counties. But we didn't set out to um, have an archive, to have a museum. <clears throat> we set out to preserve the history of this region. But as we were growing and we had offices and we had some people in place, folks were coming to us with documents, artifacts, photographs, et cetera, pieces of their lives that they didn't know what to do with it. They were afraid that it was gonna be lost forever. And this was also at a time when Homestead didn't have its own historical society. There wasn't an entity to collect this. So as people were leaving the region and, you know, it, it, you, know there, you know, we lost so much population during that time, there was this great fear by the people here that this legacy and this memory would be lost. So it be, begins rather organically that way. Um, by the mid to late 90s, we started really concentrating on how do we set up an archive? How do we tell a community story? How do we work with communities to preserve their history? And we started doing town meetings, going out through these communities, talking to people, trying to understand what matters, what needs to be saved, what stories should be told. That, you know, again, we started massing this stuff organically. And when I started here in 1998, there was a few shelves worth of stuff, no great organization to it, no, no real plan to preserve it. So it became my job and then some others after me to um, work to preserve this history. And we've built um, what I would like to think is a world-class archive that, that tells the story of um, the industrial legacy of this region and the, the peopling of this region, so that culture of steel. And we're not doing this you know, the way you know, a lot of other archives exist. We don't have US Steel giving us their papers. Um, we're not that type of archive. We're really more of a community and, and personal-based archive. You know, we have some collections that exist of one item. We have others that are thousands of items. You know, our collections are very mixed, unlike a lot of archives. Some archives are very, very straightforward of documents, photographs, you know, paper-based. Uh, we have a mixed collection. Our, 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 you know, our artifacts run from the smallest of, of um, union pins to an entire rolling gun. So it, it is very mixed. And, and really what it comes down to is all of these pieces help to tell this story of the region and, and continue the legacy of the people who lived here and worked here. We, we collect a lot of oral histories. We do a lot of community work. We've worked with, with 
organizations and institutions throughout the region to do exhibitions, to tell their story, to teach others how to tell their story. So there are a lot of different ways that we can um, be effective within the community and make sure that we are fulfilling our mission. Our mission is to preserve the legacy of this region and help promote economic revitalization and keep this legacy alive. And one of the most distinguishing features of our archive is the fact that we are still very much in active collection. Most of the time, if you want to visit an archive and do work there, chances are they haven't collected new material in a very, very, very long time. Yeah, they're very passive. Yes, they're very, they're passive in the way that they receive items. They don't necessarily go out and go through abandoned buildings and find pallets worth of wooden, of wooden molds and wooden patterns and figure out ways to take them out of those buildings and preserve them. They're not necessarily doing that kind of work. And so the kind of work that we're doing is very much not just a preservation of the past, but it's paying attention to the living memory that still exists within this region because the end of Big Steel in Pittsburgh wasn't really that long ago. And because it wasn't really that long ago, we still have an enormous population of people who were personally affected by the industry, whose lives were shaped by the industry, whose families' histories were shaped by the industry. And they don't just have papers. They don't just have photographs and objects. They have stories. Mm -hmm. They have their living memories. And those are the things that we set out to actively collect. We want to hear about those stories. We want people to put themselves on tape so that we can keep those voices alive and so that we can keep those stories safe. Um, so for us, it's very much active. It's very much a living organism. And it's very much something that is, even though we are focused on the past, we are still doing this with an eye towards what's happening in the community right now and what's going to happen to this community in the future and how can we best be positioned to preserve all of those things. Right, we are not static by any means. No. And, and, and so a lot of folks have this notion of archives and museums as being just that, being static in the past, what was, and that's part of it. But it, we're also looking at where we are now and where we're going. And as a result, you know, we have a very varied collection. Um, you know, we, Ron said it before, but we have quite a cross section. You know, we have objects, we have photographs, we have documents, film. Um, we have a lot, we do have our own library here with books. We have a lot of oral histories. Um, you know, we, we, we have pretty much honestly anything you could almost imagine related to iron and steel down here. And we still do actively collect. Um, and to some extent too, part of the reason I mentioned the variety of the objects, you know, I think sometimes when people are going to the archives or any archives, um, they don't realize that there is a wealth more there than they might expect is there, right? You go in thinking, well, maybe I'll find some documents. Maybe I'll find some photographs. But you, you are really going to have the potential to find quite a bit more than you might expect. Um, in the terms of how we collect, though, maybe this is a good time very briefly, too, to talk about, you know, how really, in court, how did Rivers of Steel get all this stuff? How do archives actually get the items that they possess? Um, so really, it's it's one of two things. Um, now, there's the obvious thing here, which is that in some cases, you know, archives similar to a museum might purchase an item, right? This is not nearly as common as it's going to be in the case of something like a museum or a library, you know, when the library purchases books, for example, right? But like archives, you know, sometimes in the past, not as much as we used to, but, you know, we're on eBay, you know, punching in Homestead Works and seeing what comes up, right? Because there might be an item there um, that should be in our collection, that we want in our collection, that would be a benefit to the public. So sometimes archives do have budgets for these type of purposes. However, that is, especially in our case, the vast minority of the items that we've collected. Most of our items are direct donations by individuals um, or sometimes groups um, that go through a, a specific donation process, which is to say, you know, everything in an archive or an archive that's doing what it's supposed to be is all by the book um, on board with a trail of paperwork, not just to 
protect us and the person who donates, but also because something that archives are very concerned with is establishing provenance, meaning that, you know, if someone is looking at this collection, they know where it came from, where that person came from, they could kind of be traced backwards. So let's say that you're going to donate something to Rivers of Steel. Perhaps, you know, your grandfather had some hard hats that you wanted to give us, right? What's going to happen is you're going to bring those into us and basically... We're going to look, we're going to assess, because again, we don't necessarily take everything. Now, we'll probably take the hard hats, but any archive that you want to donate something to, they do need to assess it, first of all, to make sure it's actually something that fits in the scope of their collection. It would actually work for them. Um, and, and it is, you know, is what they actually set out to prove. Once that happens, basically, you, the donator, and us, the archive, both sign a little piece of paper called a deed of gift, which acknowledges that you guys are handing us the item over legally becomes ours. And in turn, we make a set of agreements on our end about how that item is going to be kept and what is going to be done with it. By which I mean, you know, we agree basically to preserve it, to keep it in the public trust and also to have a few qualifications put in mind. So for example, if a date were ever to come that we had to, and this happens very rarely, I want to clarify this, but we had to get rid of that item. You know, we would, you would put on there, would you like the item back? Would we send it to another institution, et cetera? Um, you know, we have it there. He is session an item. Now in our case, we, we have done that with some things. And an example would be, um, we had some models donated to us a number of years ago as part of a larger collection. Quite a bit of it fit our collection. The models, however, were from steel mills that were not in this region. So were we the best home for it? No. So we deaccessioned those models and we went through a series of steps. We found the first step is if the donor doesn't want the objects back, because that's the first step is if the donor wants it. If the donor doesn't want the objects back, you find another repository that would be interested. So again, the idea is to keep these items within the public domain. And, and that really is the key point, which is when you find an object which is in our archive, or, or again, in theory, everybody else's archive, every archive that's working on those same ethical principles, you can rest assured that that item exists within that public domain. Meaning that, you know, while you may not be able to like copy and sell it, it is something that you have access to, right? It is not something that belongs to some third party, essentially. Right? This is not, it's not in the hands of a private collector. It's not in the hands of a private collector. So in turn, you know, that is, again, that is just part of our actual, you know, duty as an archive is to keep these things preserved as a essentially almost neutral party to preserve it for the public, for you. And again, it's that really just put it this way. At the end of the day, the last thing, the very last thing you want really is to see large amounts of this stuff go into the hands of private collectors, which is nothing against private collectors, right? But it is more about just ensuring that these things remain accessible. But they belong to the public so that the public can learn from them and enjoy them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and know that 20 years down the line, they will still be there. So once these items are, are sessioned in, they're part of the collection, we go through a process of preservation and conservation if it's needed. That's actually the next, next week. <laughs> we'll get into, into the, the nitty gritty of it, but we make sure that the items are properly stored, properly conserved, and that they can then be held within these archives in, in, a, in a responsible way. Um, after that, everything is cataloged into a database and then is made available for folks who are interested, who's interested, who comes in and use the uses the archive. Um, anywhere, anybody from students doing you know, school reports to documentarians working on, on films and documentaries, um, lots of authors come in and do research. We have um, folks who are looking to uh, rehab a building in a community that we may have photos or drawings of. Um, there's a lot of family work that comes in. People are very interested in genealogy and wanna know what we have. Um, 
we also work with legal firms that are doing research for law cases. Um, and then the biggest thing really for us in a lot of ways is how we use it internally for interpretation. If you come and take a Rivers of Steel tour, whether it's our boat tour or it's one of our bus tours, or if you come to the carry furnaces, the material that is used for the stories, for the narrative is coming from these collections, whether it's from an oral history or it's from the documents and artifacts that are held here. That's what is allowing us to tell the narrative in, in the most honest and, and true way that we can. And so when, when objects come to us as part of a collection, one of the things that we're talking about, we use the term collection a lot. And you'll notice that we use collections, plural, and collection, singular. So in an archive, you're going to find a lot of small collections that are individual, that come from individual places, individual donors, that fit within a larger collection. So you've got sort of an umbrella, right? You've got something that is much larger that is broken then down into smaller pieces. And we thought that um, we would kind of wrap this portion up tonight by showing you a box of material, of items from one of the collections in our collection. So. Not that that's confusing. So <laughs> what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. And we're gonna play show and tell. We're gonna play show and tell. So these items are all from one donor. Um, yeah. a, a gentleman named Ron Neisel, who has been collecting resources on this region for a number of years. He has you know, various things that he collects, some of it he keeps at home, but he is fascinated with documents, photographs, and ephemera related back to the industrial legacy of this region. So he had, he's, he's what we like to, in lovingly, loving terms, call a habitual donor. Who, who, he donates a lot of things to us. So just within his collection, you may have something like this, I don't know how well you can see that. Here, we'll let you pull that. Mm -hmm. Which is an employee ID badge. Or you may have a document from 1838 with Jessup Steel. Or for the rail fans out there, this is a sampling of photographs from the H.K. Porter Company. H.K. Porter was a builder of small gauge locomotives uh, based out of Lawrenceville that began in 1860 and continued to build in Lawrenceville until uh, the late 1950s. And their narrow gauge locomotives were sent all over the world. And this is a builder's photo. So it, yeah, no. I'm just fishing and fishing and finding a button from American Fighters. This is an ID badge, right? Mm -hmm. ID yeah. So you'll notice that it's not all paper. Um, they're not all books. They're not all written documents. That there are, there are objects that we are also concerned with. So sometimes, and that's, that's also another key difference. When we're talking about libraries versus archives, one of the biggest differences is that libraries are concerned with collecting texts. So they're concerned with collecting books primarily. Um, and so you're very rarely in a library going to find a lot of extra objects that are not paper related. Right. Well, you know, <clears throat> You may find it at a university research library, you'll have dissertations, you'll have things like that, but it's still all very much that paper based. It's all text based. Right. Yep. Exactly. And you know, we have a very mixed collection, which makes it a very rich collection, a collection that is exceedingly useful to tell all of these different stories. Mm -hmm. So, well, you might come to us with a question related to genealogy. We might not be able to find exactly where your great grandfather worked, but we might have material that are that, that could be related to the kind of job that he might have done. Mm -hmm. 
So you might not find his name on a logbook, but what you might find is an ID badge that is similar to one that he might have worn. You might find um, you might find a series of orders that come from a shop that are similar to the kind of shop that he might have worked in. So you might not necessarily find the person that you are looking for, but you're going to find a lot of contextual material. Exactly. That's what you're going to do. You're yep. going to add context to this story. Mm -hmm. So you know, I you know, our goal oftentimes is to add meat to the bone. So yeah. somebody, somebody comes in, they want it again, genealogy is mm -hmm. a, a great example. You know, my, my, you know, grandfather was a puddler. What does that mean? What does that mean? Exactly. So, so occasionally, occasionally you get lucky, you can find their name on an employee card, but that's not really the main function of our archive. Uh, we don't have a lot of that, but we can tell you about what life was like what life was like in the mill, what his job was like, what life was like in the community and build that context around it. So then you have a much fuller picture of what life was like. That it's no longer just a name. It's no longer just a name on a birth certificate or a death certificate or even, or even a name on a steamship. Um, that there's going to be a lot more behind that name. There's going to be a story behind it and there's going to be a life behind it. And there's going to be an entire family legacy behind it as well. Um, so we might not get you the name, but we might get you more than what you were looking for. And all of that becomes a jumping off point for you at other repositories and other archives to find even more information because then you know where to home in. And I know we're getting towards the, yes. the end of this. We're undercover as a slave slash spy and shared secrets um, with the Union Army. Uh, the Vendus sent her to the school um, right after um, she was enslaved and she worked as a spy, uh, excuse me, she worked as a spy for the Union Army, and because she worked in the house, in the kitchen, when they were having meetings there uh, in the house, she would listen and share the information and the plans that they were discussing in the house, and she'd take them back to the Union uh, officials. One of the interesting things about uh, the purchase of her, it was almost as if uh, she was a toy or an object that they saw her and they said, well, we're going to purchase her okay. had to be a place. Okay. I'm not sure that was for us. I'm not sure that was for us. Although it, it was very interesting, particularly to me, who specializes in women in the Civil War. Um, I was, my interest was immediately piqued by that. But um, I think we have uh, probably about 10 minutes or so mm -hmm. to answer questions that people might have. Ooh, shy. Hmm? Either that we were so good, covered everything. Or actually, here's a question that we get very frequently, right? Is where do we get the money for all of this? Mm -hmm. Where does the money come to, to actually establish to establish this archive, where does the money come to maintain it? That's something that when I'm giving tours of carry, um, people ask me that question a lot. Right. We, we get that all across the board. And the assumption a lot of times, going back to what Ryan was talking about earlier, is, oh, you get federal money for this. Um, not specifically for what you're seeing here, no. Um, it helps cover salaries and other components of what we do, but that's not what pays for these collections. We do a lot of grant writing an awful lot of grant writing. That is how we've been able to do preservation programs. That's how we were able to get these shelves. It, there's, it, it's really a constant search for, for that funding to keep this legacy alive. But it's also, along with that, we get a lot of volunteers. And we're always looking for more of folks who want to come help out within the archives. Um, you know, it's one thing to be able to buy the materials. It's let a, yet another thing to have folks who want to sit down and process these materials right. and, and go through the materials. And I can tell you right now, it is, it sounds like it might be arduous. It's a lot of fun. 
because you get to see all of these different pieces and learn something from them. And each one tells a story. So, you know, it is, you know, public money. We do occasionally get some foundations that help us out and we get donations as well. Right. Um, we do have a question from Kevin and Jason. So if you wanted to unmute yourselves, you can go ahead and ask your question, ask away. Hello. Um, I imagine that you get a lot of materials. Do you have an acquisition checklist to help you decide what you accept and what you don't accept? And then maybe help it for people who want to donate something that may not be a fit for the collection, but don't right. necessarily understand why or why not. So um, actually, if you go to our website, um, under preservation, you go down, it, 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 there's a whole section about donating. And that will give you an idea of the areas in which we collect um, and has kind of a small synopsis of what our collections policy is. So really what we're looking at is throughout this region, throughout the eight counties, it is the legacy of iron and steel. And that is not, um, that is not exclusive just to iron and steel, but it's the coal and coke industry, it's riverboats, it's the story of the peopling of the region and, you know, really looking at things from an ethnographic standpoint, socially and culturally. So it's pretty broad. Um, on the other end of it, when something does come in, we, we go through an accessions process. And, and that process is, you know, collectively, the, the, the staff um, reviews what came in. And is, that, is it something that A, fits within our collection? So for example, if somebody brings in, um, and I'm using this because this was a real thing, a lingerie box from the Keysport, you know, from the 1940s, nothing wrong with that. That's not us. That's not what we're looking to collect. So we could make a recommendation to that donor to go to the McKeesport Heritage Center or even the Heinz History Center to, to donate that. Or other times they'll say, hey, I'm giving you 30 things. Take that and you can place it. And we will do that as well. But we go through that process of does it have informational and you know, evidential value for our collections? Does it fit our collections? A and what's the end use? A and are we, are we able to preserve it to the best of its abilities or of our abilities? And there are things that we, we do say no about. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about end use, what do you mean? And, um, is it of value to researchers? Is it of value for us interpretively? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is the public going to want and need to have access to this? And so just here's a question in the chat. What specific areas do you focus on? And does it include the Keysport, for example? Um, well, we just went through some mm -hmm. of the specific yeah. areas. And yes, mm -hmm. the Keysport very much. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I made mention of the Keysport Heritage Center. They have, over the past 20 years, really grown quite a bit and are, have become very um, professional and capable stewards of the collections which they have. So there are some items that if it's looking more at social life in McKeesport, that they are really the better repository. But I can tell you behind me and within the rooms around us, there's an awful lot here that has to do with National Tube. And National Tube was the lifeblood of, of McKeesport for, you know, over 120 years. And, and along those lines too, I mean, our, um, you know, our organization's kind of collection uh, focus has, has changed somewhat as we evolve. And again, as Ron's saying, as organizations like the McKeesport Historical Society have, um, you know, kind of Will either come back or come into their own or begun collecting again. You know, so once upon a time, you know, in lieu of other organizations, for example, you know, we collected a lot of uh, materials related to, you know, local communities, right? Um, and as time has gone on and other organizations have come up to kind of fill a gap that existed before where there is it now, 
um, you know, we've collected less, say, materials related necessarily to, you know, high school yearbooks, for example, right? Um, you know, pictures of community days that aren't necessarily related to iron and steel or industry. Um, but, you know, we, you know, over time, like I said, we still have some of that material, um, but it's, it's focused a lot more these days, especially on, again, as it relates to, to kind of industry. However, let's say we don't collect things from local communities too. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and there are times where we have collected because there is a void, which is as Ryan was alluding to. And once there is an entity there that shows that they can be, um, in the proper terms, responsible stewards, then we will deaccession collections and get them to another repository. Again, it's all based upon keeping these items in the public domain and being as responsible as we can in doing so. And for us too, it also, um, it also comes down to addressing things that we call archival silences or gaps. And these are, you know, historically speaking, these gaps and silences occur when an archive sets out to tell a particular story. And so when they make those collections, the collections tell that very particular story. What ends up happening is that things get left out. People get left out, communities get left out. So you're getting one version of a story. It's not necessarily the whole version, but it is one version and it is a very particular and specific one. So one of the things that we as Rivers of Steel are looking to do is to address those silences and address those gaps. For example, we are looking these days much more in the direction of collecting from black communities in the area, understanding that um, black laborers in and around Pittsburgh, specifically those people who were part of the steel industry don't necessarily have a place where their stories are preserved and held in public trust. So part of it means securing public trust. Part of it means um, being those responsible stewards. And one of the ways that we can be those responsible stewards is by addressing the very real silences and gaps that exist in any archive because archives come with intention. And so, when you open those things up and you open veins for collection up, you're also addressing the places that were either overlooked or not included in, in previous mm -hmm. eras. Did anybody have any other questions? Were there anything, was there anything that anybody wanted to know? Um, because I do see that it's 6.59 and I, I don't want to <laughs> keep, you, uh, keep you too long. Okay. Well, if there was nothing else, oh. was there? Okay. No, if there was nothing else, um, I think I would turn it back over to Emily to do any sort of uh, ending housekeeping for the evening. Sure. <clears throat> so I just put in the chat one more time, the link to um, reserve a spot for any, for the next three sessions that we'll be doing. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact your personal library or um, when you registered, my email is also there if you have any other questions. And if you have questions that we can get to today, feel free, we save them. We have more to talk about next time and have a good night. Thank you.